All aboard for the transcribed premiere production, The Cruise of the Paul Parrot. That thrilling adventure story of whaling days when the small craft roamed the mighty sea capturing monsters of the deep. Captain Dalton and his first mate, George Wainwright, of the good ship Paul Parrot, have been attempting to track down a Spaniard named Altesti, who has been causing them all sorts of trouble. They met a young boy named Johnny Robbins, who had just run away from home to go to sea. Altesti, believing Johnny to be Dalton's cabin boy, captured him, and under cover of night rode to the Paul Parrot. After binding Johnny and hiding him in a whale oil cask on the ship, Altesti and his henchman Poncho were discovered by second mate Jowett and Dickon, the peg-leg sailor. Shots were exchanged, but Altesti once more evaded his pursuers. It is now morning, and we find Captain Dalton, Wainwright, Mr. Grange, and the crew aboard the Paul Parrot preparing to weigh anchor. Blow me down, George. I'll never forgive myself for letting that boy fall into the hands of that swab, Altesti. Alas, Roy, there's no cause to feel that way. It was no fault of yours. But I like that lad. He was a bright boy. You can lay to that. Here he helped us find Altesti, and we bungled our trick and let the Spaniard get away and lay hands on the lad as well. Ah, mate, this Altesti is a fast bloke. One moment we had him at the muzzle of our pistols. The next moment, before I could think, he grabbed the lad and held him in front of him. We couldn't shoot then, or he'd have hit the boy. Well, who was he anyway, a cabin boy from one of the ships? No, Mr. Grange. He was a lad who'd just run away from home. His parents lived somewhere upstate. Mm, just a wharf wave, eh? Well, why didn't you shoot anyway? This man Altesti seems to be dangerous to have at large. What? Shoot the boy to get the Spaniard? What difference would it have made? He's probably just some gutter puppy whom no one would miss. His life would be worth little. Mr. Grange, you amaze me. I wouldn't have shot the boy if my own safety depended on it. You're too tender-hearted, Captain. Well, no matter, though. The, the sea will harden you. You're still young in this business. But we'll soon be far out to sea, and since there's no chance of this scoundrel boarding us now, we may as well forget it. I can't imagine what his purpose was in heckling you. He couldn't have been authorized by his firm. We've always been on very good terms with De Silva and company. Mr. Grange, I may sail the seas until I'm as old as the Rock of Gibraltar. But I hope I'll never forget to have consideration for my fellow man. Very pretty sentiment, Captain Dalton. But let's forget the incident. Very well, sir. There's a spanking offshore breeze springing up that should send us out of harbor in no time. We'll have the men spread full canvas as soon as Mr. Jowett, the second mate, comes up. Then we'll set sail. There's one thing we can be thankful for, sir. We've no greenies on this cruise. All old hands. We'll waste no time in leaving shore behind us. Aye, aye. You can thank George Grange and Sons for that. They've allowed us to get a crew that'd be a credit to any merchant band, let alone a whaler. Hello there, Captain Dalton. Oh, Mr. Grange, Mr. Wainwright. Well, good morning uh, to good you. Morning, good morning, good morning, Mr. Mr. Breckenridge. Uh, well, Mr. Grange, now that Mr. Breckenridge is here, as soon as he leaves for shore, we'll be ready to sheet the sails home for the voyage. That's fine, Captain Dalton. I see everything has been very well prepared aboard. You can thank our shipkeeper, Mr. Breckenridge, for that, sir. He has helped me a great deal in getting this craft ship shape. Oh, Captain Dalton, you flatter me. You know, gentlemen, this is really a fine day for a voyage. This offshore breeze will put you out of sight of land in sight of half an hour. Yes, that's something to be thankful for. Oh, uh, by the way, I've been wanting to ask you, did you find anything more of this man, Al Testy? Well, to tell the truth, Mr. Breckenridge, Mr. Wainwright and I traced him to the docks, but he got away. Well, if you'll pardon me for suggesting it, about this man, Al Testy, I mean, I've been thinking about him a great deal. It's come to me when I've seen him before. I remember very plainly about two years ago... Oh! oh, oh, oh. Blow me down. Someone's bounced a belaying pin off the back of his head. Where did that come from? He was right in the middle of a sentence. He's unconscious. Here, Wainwright. Run. Get some water and a bandage. We'll send him back to the dock immediately. Aye, aye, sir. I'll be right back. I can't imagine where that could have been dropped from, Captain. It didn't drop, Mr. Grange. That belaying pin was thrown. But all the crew were down in the forecastle. Who could have thrown it? Someone who'd been listening to our conversation. You can lay to that. When he started to tell me something about Altesti, he was struck. But who on earth would know whom he was talking about? There's no telling. Here, Captain, is the water in the bandage. I'll bathe his temples. Havas, that was a mean crack he got athwart his crown. He's coming too, sir. Uh, oh, I thought... Uh, oh, where am I? Oh, yes. I remember... Who struck me down? We don't know, Mr. Breckenridge. Are you in much pain? Somewhat. Yes. You'd better get me back to the docks. Mr. Jowett. Here, help Mr. Breckenridge down to the catboat and tell the oarsmen to get him back to harbor as fast as they can. He's hurt. Aye, aye, sir. Let me help you, sir. 
We've got to take advantage of this wind, Mr. Wainwright. We're about to sail. Summon all hands. Aye, aye, sir. All hands on deck. Stand by to weigh anchor and sheet home sails. Aye, aye, sir. Line up here, all hands. Ready for sailing. Men, I want to speak to you all later. I have something to say that may help us get along better. But right now, we're put to it to work swiftly and take advantage of this wind. Strain your utmost. Take charge, Mr. Wainwright. All right, men. Get ready to weigh anchor. You four, aloft to sheet home the canvas. I know you're not greenies. Now, hop to it. Pardon me, Mr. Grange. I want to be sure the shipkeeper gets off safely. Oh, very well, Captain. I'll go to my cabin. If I find anything about the culprit who hurled that belaying pin, I'll inform you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jowett, is Mr. Breckenridge safe at the catboat? Aye, aye, sir. They're casting off. Don't worry about me, Captain. It's just a knock on the head. I'll be all right. Have a prosperous voyage. Thank you, sir. Have that head tended to right away, mind you. Keep a weather eye open for any more of that sort of thing. Goodbye to you. Goodbye and good luck. Hmm. I wonder. Mr. Jewett, will they leave Mr. Wainwright? See that the sail is set and the men assume their duties. Send Wainwright after me. Aye, aye, sir. Hmm. Maybe I was wrong about Mr. Ezra Grange. I thought he was a fine young man. But anyone who could talk so heartlessly of shooting down a lad simply because he had run off to go to sea, it does put him in a cruel light. I wonder. And then that belaying pin. And that one-legged sailor, Dickon. Mm, I'm still not satisfied about him. Blow me down. I'm beginning to wonder how correct George was when he said this was going to be a mysterious voyage. Call me Captain? Yes, Mr. Wainwright. It's all right. Drop the formality. There are no men around. George, who threw that belaying pin? Uh, I give my right eye to know. Mr. Breckenridge was hit just as he was about to tell that he'd seen this swab al testy some time ago. Just when he was drawn the particulars, the pin hit him. And no one was in sight? No one aloft at the time, either. Must have been thrown by someone with a good harpoon on. Ah, you've hit it there, George. That puts me thinking. I thought this ship carried 33 of the finest men that ever trod wood over ocean. But it's plain to see there's those who require watching. By the way, Roy, second mate Jowett reports that last night, just before we boarded the Paul Parrot, he and Dickon were on deck and saw two mysterious men running toward the forecastle. When they yelled at them, all they heard was a splash, as though someone jumped overboard. They searched the ship, but found no one. So he forgot about the incident until he reported it to me this morning. So, apparently they both didn't jump overboard. Wainwright, there's somebody on this boat who's not supposed to be here. But where? Jowett said he and Dickens searched the entire schooner. But they couldn't find anything out of the ordinary. Ah! Ah! Timber me starboard timbers. There's scuttle aloft. Ah! <laughs> Listen, George. Even old Dickens' parrot knows there's some funny business going on. Ah! Ah! Give a lobby the harpoon. Ah! Hey, quiet that bird or take him aft. Uh, wait a moment. What's in that whale oil cask the parrot is perched on? I believe it's empty. How fast, mate. We'll soon find out. Aye. Ah. You see, from here, one could easily throw that belaying pin and then drop back in the cask and close the lid. Listen. Did you hear that? Blow me down, I do. There's someone in that cask. Off with the lid. It's a stowaway, I'll wager. Look. Look. He's bound and gagged. Why, why George, it's the lad. It's Johnny.
So they finally found Johnny in the whale oil cask. But who threw that belaying pin at the shipkeeper just when he was about to give some important information regarding Altesti? Can Altesti still be aboard? And is Sue's brother, Ezra Grange, the hard-hearted person he seems to be? Well, as old Dickon would say, blow me down, there'll be many a squall in store before the cruise of the Paul Parrot is ended. So be sure not to miss even one adventure in this exciting story of the sea. Your Paul Parrot announcer is Dave Ward.